Good morning, everybody. I know it's Thursday, but good morning, everybody. How many of you have been here since Sunday? Hang in there. Two more days to go. Plow through. Don't let the networking fall apart, though. I hope, hope you're having a really good week. A couple more days to go. Good, uh, good classes left and, uh, and good networking time left. Uh, only one announcement. Uh, tomorrow we will cl start classes at 8 o'clock. Um, the uh, uh, lunch break will be shorter to try to get you guys out of here a little bit earlier in the afternoon to catch your flights. So 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, uh, again, breakfast will be, be out here. So that's the only announcement I have, and it's my pleasure to announce our this morning keynote, William McKnight. William is a consultant, speaker, and author in information management. His, con his company, McKnight Consulting Group, has attracted clients such as Fidelity Invested Investments, Teva Pharmaceuticals, Scotiabank, Samba Bank, Pfizer, French Telecom, and Verizon, 16 of the Global 2000. William is also a very popular speaker worldwide and a prolific writer with hundreds of articles and white papers published. As an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of, the, Entrepreneur of the Year finalist and former Fortune 50 technology executive and software engineer, William provides clients with actions plans, architectures, strategies, complete programs, and vendor neutral tool selection to manage information. William's keynote this morning is titled Capitalizing on Chaos, Navigating Information Management po Possibilities to Build Organizational Value. So with that, I give you William McKnight. Thank you, Paul. Welcome to Thursday. Congratulations for making it this far. But congratulations even more so for picking very well in your career because we're sitting on the gold of our organizations. And it's my goal this morning to help open up the possibilities to you to show you that for one, that relational row-based data warehouse that maybe you've been struggling with trying to put everything into may not be the full and complete answer to your information management needs. Before I begin, though, let me tell you that I like to get to my, uh, my seminars really early just to let everybody know that I'm, I'm here, I'm okay, I'm going to be talking and all that. But uh, this morning I went up to the, the second floor, and then to compound the problem, I went on those escalators on up to the third floor where it was desolate, and I was really beginning to wonder if I'm having my Hello Cleveland moment. Anybody remember that from Spinal Tap where they're running around trying to find their way to the stage going, hello Cleveland. Well, I made it and I'm glad I made it because I got some really important things to share with you in the span of about 40 minutes. Uh, it's going to be packed and uh, please uh, sit tight and hopefully there'll be something in here of interest to you immediately. But more importantly, I hope I'm seeding some strategic ideas with you because my premise is that there is no one size fits all and that the vendor community which has supported information management so well over the past few years, and we see a lot of innovation happening, even this week I'm impressed with the innovation that I've been hearing about from our, our vendor partners. The reason for all that is because, again, we're sitting on the gold of our organization. Information is an asset of the business. Information is the competitive landscape for business over the next five to ten years. And now you're going to have all this information from TDWI to go back and be the champions of that information strategy at your organization. You need to have more at your disposal than just the data warehouse. I know that's what you may be working on. I've had some guru sessions with you. I've met a lot of you in the hallways and so on. Talk to you about where you are. You know what? At this institute, you're everywhere. A lot of you are still working on that first data warehouse. Okay. And some of you have more of what I'm going to put up here in terms of your architectures. They're more complex. That's okay. We all still have a long way to go because performance is king with information. We have to get our information into the right vessel to perform for our business. And it's going to be really important to pick the right platform for your information. Sometimes your information will go into multiple platforms. That's okay. Obviously, the data warehouse is one of them. It's a redundant data store in the environment. Probably, eventually, we won't need it, but why do we need it? Because of all the limitations in our current operational systems, which are slowly going away. So what's going to happen? Well, 
we have to first start by talking about our workloads. And I'll use sheep as an example, of course. So what's a workload? I really seldom get into arguments with clients or discussions with clients about what a workload is. All right, it's really a combination of a set of data and the things you're going to do with that data. But you can group a workload in so many different ways. It is important to get your arms around what is a workload because what I'm going to tell you is to put that workload in the right platform for its characteristics in order for it to succeed for the business. So we group our workloads, we have a bunch of them in our, in our company. Each of those workloads could go into a different vessel, and that's my point, because they have unique characteristics. There is no one size fits all. If you've been doing the same thing as you have been doing all along, and you have a knee jerk reaction to every new requirement to do the same thing you did with the last requirement, you might want to stop yourself and pause and really think about the possibilities here. Because true return on information doesn't come from just the cost of ownership of the storage. It comes from the cost of not being able to use that information. That information not performing for your business. And so we really got to get the information activated. It takes a lot of good internal PR to get this message through. But really, that's part of your challenge. Now, now that you know that that's part of your challenge, you need to go back and take up the realm, the helm of championing information and championing architecture. To be sure, this is all about architecture. As a matter of fact, I like to say, that's all we do in information management, is a series of successive iterations of architecture. But what determines success of our workloads? Number one, it's going to be performance. We get that information to perform. Oh, I know there's a variety of things, data quality and, and all that, but that data has to perform. The users have to know whether they're gonna be sitting there with an hourglass, or if it's coffee time, or if they're actually gonna be able to go deep, deep into layers of information to get to deep levels of analysis where hopefully they can do the right thing with that. And that's the other side of the coin. We have to also grow the user community in terms of their ability to utilize the information that we're going to be providing. Fast performance, which means we gotta get up and running quickly. We, we don't have the six months to a year to do R&D on this stuff, we have to get it up and running quickly. Am I talking about Agile? Yes, I am. Yes, Agile, maybe Scrum. But that is really uh, applicable, hopefully you've, some of you have caught that this week, that's really applicable to what we do, information management. And finally, scale. The business doesn't want to see us scrambling around behind the scenes over and over again, trying to do the same thing, trying to bring our architecture up to standard. If you've been hitting your head against the wall with any of your workloads, it might be because it's not platformed correctly. Consider that, because if you just do the same old platform, the chances of success just from a platform perspective is lower than if you get into the right category, and I'll talk about the categories, if you get into the best category, and there is, there is a best category it's actually probably a best tool as well, best platform, for every workload. And I wanna help you get closer to that because the closer you get to that, the greater your chance of success with that workload. It's gonna be heterogeneous and I'm going to give you some tips at the end of the presentation on how to make it all thread together and work together. So you do have to lay a foundation in order for this to work. If you accept some of my premise here, that we're going to have a heterogeneous information management architecture, you do need some foundation in place. So know that we'll get to that uh, later in the presentation. So this I call the no reference architecture. This should look somewhat familiar to Data Warehouse Institute attendees. All right, so we've got our legacy sources. Quickly going around the horn here on this. Most of our legacy sources are relational databases. Now. Call them ERPs if you want. Where has all the innovation happened in the information management realm in the past five to 10 years? It's all over here on the right side of the line, on the right side of the data integration line. This is where most of us live, but guess what? Our skills 
are so important to the business now that they're bleeding back over into the operational side. And the operational side is doing things like master data management, operational business intelligence, stream processing, operational dashboards, these sorts of things. And they're asking us on this side of the line to come over and help them. Our influence as information managers, we started over here because they didn't really have the discipline on the ERP side of things, but our influence is growing in the organization. Recognize that. What else do we have here? We have operational applications and users. We've got our data warehouse. Okay, we know that feeds some dependent data marts. And then we have cubes in there, maybe as data marts. Now I have a whole presentation on cubes, which I won't get into, because they can really be abused in organizations. But I'll stop myself on that point right now and go on into some of the new things. Now, they like data stream processing, okay? So I'm giving you some perspective on where these things happen, but I do call this, by the way, the no reference architecture, because it's not really a reference architecture. Do you remember back in the, the 90s when the vendors used to come around to your shops with their laminated reference architecture and say, this is it, this is what you've got to strive for? And it wasn't customized at all, and it was very intimidating. Okay, I was on the IT side of things at some point in there, and it was very intimidating. Oh, we've, we've got to do that. Well, those days are gone. Those days are gone. There is no good reference architecture, one size fits all, just like with technology and platforms. There's no one size fits all for these architectures. So I call it the no reference architecture. So don't look at it like this is to be your reference architecture. It's not, it's just putting in perspective all of these vessels that I'm talking about where we are going to put information. So, okay, I said data stream processing. That is, quickly, that is processing, processing upon data that hasn't even hit a database yet. So you talk about real time, that's real time. That is real time. Now we wanna marry that with some other data like, I'm gonna say master data management data. See, it all, it all works together. I had this philosophy that if I want to create a great presentation or article, all I have to do is take any two of these things and put them together and say, what's the intersection of these two things? And in reality, there's stuff to say about the intersection of any two of these things up here. I hope you think of yourselves as information managers and not data warehouse architects or what have you, because your company needs an information manager. Maybe it's a chief architect, chief data architect. I've heard some different titles even here this week about this role, but somebody needs to be looking over the big picture. So we got data stream processing in there. Put that on the table. If you hear your business talking about, we really need to react quickly to transactions, like in the financial community, wash trades, fraudulent trades, uh, theft, that sort of thing that happens really quickly, next best offer deals, all right? A lot of that, is happening through data stream processing. Also, we've got master data. Now, I'll come back to master data management a little bit later. But that plays a very important role in the no reference architecture. If you can see a little bit beyond maybe where you are right now, all of these applications, all of these need master data. I like to say, you need master data management, or you're doing master data management, no matter what, in all of your applications, you just may not be doing it well. So why not do it well? Embrace the discipline of master data management for the no reference architecture. So I'll get back to that. I do have two icons up here for master data. One is, of course, the hub where the master data is stored and collected and distributed from, but the other is trying to be a workflow picture because to some of you, that's what master data is. It's a way to, to build your master records through a workflow environment. Next, I have syndicated data. How many of you are bringing syndicated data? That is external data into your organizations. Okay, Qu quite a few I would imagine because there's a lot of data for sale today, whether it's Twitter data, uh, Facebook social data. Okay, that's one form of syndicated data. But really, I'm talking about stuff like Dun & Bradstreet, okay? 
um, Hart Hanks type data, Info USA, and then a lot of the industries have their own. But my point is, make this a possibility within your organization. And I say most of the time, what that's doing is supporting profiles, supporting customer profiles and so on. So that would, may, that would mean it should come into master data management hubs. And that's what I'm suggesting. Now we have columnar databases. And I put it here alongside the data warehouse. Is that right? I don't know. The architecture needs to be agile. And that means that you have to be opportunistic. It's an art form, OK? You have to know what all the possibilities are to put them on the table. Now, columnar databases, I'm going to come back to, and I'm going to spend a few minutes on a little bit later. Uh, very excited about columnar databases, as well as Hadoop. Look at that big old footprint I showed here in the environment for Hadoop. Now, I don't know. This is a real wild card. For some of you, it's going to be pretty tiny if, if, if even existent. But for others of you, it's going to be bigger than your data warehouse. Not bigger in importance, I don't think. Not in importance, but in data. OK, it's, it's a raw way to store a lot of data, what we like to call unstructured, which is data that the record structure varies from record to record, or it can vary. I'll get into that even a little bit more later on. I'm just showing you some context here. And oh, there's the data warehouse appliance. But isn't that the data warehouse? Maybe, maybe not. I'll talk about that as we go along. Again, just giving you some context of all the things. These are no SQL now. All the things that have hit your CIOs in the past five to 10 years. So I have CIOs telling me, William, tell us about data warehouse appliances. Tell us about data stream processing and columnar databases. That's what I want to know about. And you know, while I'm still trying to get my arms around these things, here comes big data like a big tsunami. And now everybody's talking about big data. I'm not even up on data warehouse appliances yet. OK? You need to catch up, though. You need to catch up. There's no easy answer. I'm not, I'm, these things are all relevant. I'm not putting up anything today that's not relevant to most enterprises. Again, this is, this is where I challenge you to be the information managers of your organizations, not the data warehouse architect. But the information managers, it's a lot bigger than, than maybe what you thought here. So the data warehouse, it's important. This is the Data Warehousing Institute. But it's not necessarily the sun upon which everything orbits around anymore. We've been peeling things off left and right of, from the data warehouse over the course of years, and rightfully so. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But finally, just to throw something else in from left field, the cloud. What, what about that? Where's your cloud strategy? Everybody needs a cloud strategy today, all right? That is going to be the thing that is going to impact IT more than anything else in our careers. Do you have your arms around the cloud? What are you putting in the cloud? Is, is it even relevant to data warehousing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's relevant. You can put your data in there. You can put your ETL in there. You can put your BI in there. You can mix and match. I have clients going all different ways into the cloud. You can do software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. You can do a variety of applications there. But probably one of the most important decisions there is public versus private. And I'm going to leave that out there with you to go figure out. But you need a cloud strategy. Today, you're sitting on the precipice of the no reference architecture. You can't go into it without a cloud strategy. Because so much of the new software is deployed on cloud. And I also will say, while I'm on that topic, you need an open source strategy. You need to figure out how to make your organization accept open source software into it. Just because it's open source, that doesn't mean you can close it off anymore. You are going to lose out if you have that, that mindset. So let me talk about columnar databases here. <clears throat> What's happened is disk density has gone up quite a bit over the past 25, 30 years, just enormously. We're packing so much more down on the disk. But I.O. is still limited. I don't know all of you, personally. But you are I.O. constrained, I can say that much. Almost without a doubt, you're I.O. constrained. Take a look. You probably are. But we haven't done anything about this problem, really, with our designs. OK, we've, some of us have been doing this for a while, right? 
My designs haven't changed that much in the past 10 years, except we're taking way more advantage of parallelism. But that's not much. We haven't designed around the problem of I.O. limitations. So what is happening is, and this is my triangle of, of data, data starts on disk. Now I know that there are full in-memory systems now, and that's just another, another angle in here for you to consider. But let's just play along here and say that there's spinning disk. It comes up into memory, call it the buffer pool, what have you. And then it moves into L2, L1 caches, um, hopefully, and hopefully it gets processed there. That is optimal, that is what you want. You don't want it to travel all the way to the CPU. So how do we stop that? How do we get it to utilize L2? Well, if L the L2 cache is full this way, if it's full of records that are still on the way up to the CPU, then it will be skipped. It's as simple as that. Same thing with the L1. The point is, you, what you want to send up the triangle is only the data that you need for that query, whether it be in the select clause or the where clause, the data you need for that query. One approach to solving this problem is with a columnar database, because a columnar database has a file for each of the columns, not one file with all of the columns in it. Columnar databases lend themselves really well to compression because you can more easily tokenize the values and have a token map somewhere else that represents what those values are. You can also see repeating values and you can compress that down to say, well, this value is going to occur for the next 50, uh, for 50 records. So that can be easily compressed in columnar. And some people are approaching the I.O. problem with SSD. It's more expensive per capita, but you have to look at your overall cost, cost of opportunities with that data. How often are your users frustrated by performance, and in the half hour window that they have to do analysis, all they can do is get a basic report out? Well, they're not going deeper. If they were able to go deeper, could they not yield some business benefit? Hopefully the answer is yes. If not, you really need to work on that side of the equation. I, don't, I won't say data scientists, but you, know, you need to develop that side of your business. It all works together. What about two or three of these together? Compression, obviously compression comes with columnar, but some vendors are really big on just straight up compression. What about SSD? SSD with columnar, with compression? Yes. Vendors are doing that as well. One very prominent one is doing that. And it's all to solve the I.O. problem. Uh, without knowing too much more, I can say that count your I.O.s, and that's a measure of your performance right there. Count the I.O.s, and that's the measure of performance. Everything else is incidental. Now, in order to really fully appreciate columnar databases, I'm going to take you down into the relational database data page for just a few minutes. It surprises me how many people have been in this industry working with these relational databases for years and years and years, or centuries and centuries, or decades and decades, I should say, and not knowing what's going on down there. So I'm going to help with the appreciation of the relational database, and also at the same time show you what you don't get in NoSQL, all right? Because this is SQL. SQL still has a place in the environment, needless to say. Okay, so what is it? Why am I showing you a data page? Well, most of the data in a relational database is gonna be a data page or an index page, okay? I'm not gonna go into index pages, but it is a file system. It is a file system. It's just that every page size numbers of K you will have a repeated pattern in that file. Of course, it's all broken down into zeros and ones, and the DBMS knows where everything is. There's a lot of math inside a, a DBMS. Good place for math majors to, to work in the DBMS. But anyway, so we've got a page header, we've got a, a small page footer, which I'll just ignore for now. Here's, here's our records. Again, we're down in a relational database data page. It might be 4K, it might be 8K, it might be 16K, it might be 64K. Okay, whatever. Here we have some records. We've got two showing. Now the point here is that every column has a value 
for every record. That's not true in columnar, okay? It's not true in NoSQL. But in a relational database data page, row-based, every column has a value. So here we see probably the uh, customer ID, the company, first name, last name, title, phone number, email, on and on and on and on. Okay, great. So what? Well, take a look down here at the row IDs. This, if somebody asked me, what is the true value of the relational database, I'm talking about the row IDs. These are the offsets to where the records actually are on the page. So you know how you might have a clustering index and you want to keep all the records in a certain order within that table, okay? The records are in order by the row IDs. That's what they're in order by. They might be all scrambled up within the page, but they're in order by the row IDs. So another thing I want to say about this is an index. What's in an index entry? The key and the RID. The key is the value. The key is the value that you're looking up, say, last name equals McKnight, OK? It goes through the B tree structure, does a lot of greater than, less than calculations through the non-leaf pages, gets to a leaf page, and there it is, McKnight, finally. And alongside McKnight is going to be a RID. Now you know what a RID is, a record ID or a row ID. And it's comprised of a page number and the row ID number upon that page where you can find the rest of the record. So I'm, if I'm doing a select splat where last name equals McKnight, I go through the B tree to get to McKnight, it says, okay, go to page 100 record ID number three to get the rest of the record. How do I get to page 100 on the file? 100 times page size, okay? That brings me to the front of the page, then I go to the end of the page, then I go, I skip the footer, and then I go two bytes times the row ID. What did I say, two? Okay, two bytes times two, it grabs the offset, and then it goes to that point in the page, and that's where the whole record is. And that's how indexes work with relational database pages. Hopefully that little aside on that helps really cement what's going on down here. And oh, by the way, var chars will add a couple bytes prior to the value to indicate the length. Nulls will add one byte prior to the value to indicate whether the value is actually on or off. I'm going to get a little less technical in a few minutes, so just hang in there if this is too much. But now let's add a record. Okay, we add another row ID, and it's an offset, and then we add a record. Voila. And, that, and on and on and on. How many records can you put on a page? Page size divided by record size. Uh, and with a little, few other things, but that's really the basic calculation. Most pages will have dozens to hundreds of records on them, and that's how it all works down here. Now, if you delete a record, the only thing that happens is in the record header, which I don't show, a bit is set to say this record is deleted, and that becomes a hole on the page. Holes are chained together. In the page header, there's a pointer to the first hole, and all the holes are chained together. Why? Because of your clustering index. If you want a record to be on this page because you're trying to force order upon the records, then it has to, it, it might compress the holes together in order to fit that record in there. In other words, it does a, as little as possible to keep everything in order, less it tries to stop itself from doing a full reorg. I'm just gonna stop right there. That's a relational database data page. That's what's going on in your oracles, your SQL servers, your Teradators, your DB2s, and so on. That's what's going on down there. Get, get fam more familiar with it, because what I find that there's a, a big knock-on effect when you know this information as to how you design. Okay, now let's look at a columnar relational database data page. Gone are the row IDs. Why are the row IDs gone? I'm still, I still have a bunch of records on here, but they're all fixed length, and it's all one value. This happens to be last name. So if I have 10 columns in a table, I'm going to have 10 files, one per column value, in my columnar version of that table. Now, some DBMSs have added columnar capabilities. Microsoft, Teradata, for example. And uh, one of them requires you to have the data in the row-based format plus the columnar format. And one of them doesn't, okay? 
And some of them ha give you the capability to put multiple columns together in one, we'll call it a vector, in one of these. This shows you just one, one value in here. No row ID because everything's fixed length. If I want to go to the third, the third value on here, I just go to the end of the page header and I count three times, three times column width and I'm there and it's Coles. Okay? That's it. Now, the key to columnar databases is that every one of these files has to keep the values in the same order, right? Because if it gets down to the end of the, the processing of the query and it glues William together with Smith instead of McKnight, then all is for naught. But that's really where a lot of the IP goes into the building of a columnar database because it knows how to keep it together. I call that process at the end gluing. It's when it's already processed all of the files, either from a select or aware perspective, and then it's materializing your final result set. And that's very important in columnar databases. All right, shifting gears. Data warehouse appliances. All right. This may look familiar to some of you. That's Natiza, uh, one of the early and still uh, very popular data warehouse appliances, obviously with IBM now. But there's a bunch of them. It's a pre-configured system for analytics. I didn't say data warehouse. For analytics built with commodity components. It might be your data warehouse, I'll get to that in a minute, but all of them extend MPP, massively parallel processing, okay? So we've gone from uniprocessing to SMP to SMP with clusters to MPP. We know MPP is the best architecture for large data. So all of them do something f more to MPP. Natiza, for example, has physical proximity of the components in the hardware. So as data comes off the disk, it's immediately processed. Okay, that's its special sauce. Others have tight integration with Hadoop data and actually bring it in. Others are all in memory, okay? Is there a right answer here? There, there probably is, but we're trying to figure it out. But all appliances are architected a little bit differently, but they're based upon MPP. One of the keys here is to why they've become so popular is the provisioning is so fast. It can be up and running very quickly. And a lot of times, circ you know, businesses, business units see this as a way to circumvent IT, et cetera, and bring in what they need. Analytic performance is very high in appliances, and the cost is less. One of the things I want to impress upon you is that if you're a company of any size, if you're trying to do your data warehouse on your OLTP database, uh, that strategy may not work for very much longer if, if you're successful, okay? And if the demand comes for that information, because IP around analytic data is going into the places I'm telling you about now, it's causing more confusion. It's going to get more complicated before it gets less complicated. And if you're waiting for everything to come together nice and neat within whatever approach that you, you are taking right now, before you move on to the next, you know, whatever it is, data warehouse appliance, Hadoop, et cetera, before you move on, you're going to fall behind. You're going to fall behind. Now's the time. It's not, it's not to wait until your data warehouse finally has all the data from all the source systems. No, it's, it's time to evaluate your situation now and on an ongoing basis. And that gets back to the role of that chief architect I talked to you about, which I hope you become for your organizations. So I'll come back to appliances in a little bit. Hadoop and big data, okay. Anytime I try to talk about Hadoop uh, in two minutes, I, I, I feel like that guy that a few years ago, that senator that said the internet was a bunch of tubes. I don't want to be that guy, <laughs> and I've only got a couple minutes. But quickly, it's, it's a combination of HDFS plus MapReduce, okay? HDFS being the file system. It's not key value. Basically, the records are just like blobs, all right? And they're all of varying sizes, having varying columns, and that sort of thing. Is Hadoop NoSQL? Well, it doesn't use SQL, all right? Uh, I don't want to get into that. I, I do call it NoSQL because it doesn't use SQL, but others don't. And I'm not trying to invent anything. I'm trying to help you so that when you leave and you read and you hear things, 
that you're able to plug them in. But the, the majority of NoSQL out there is not for our analytics, uh, not for our post-operational, and I, I think I showed you on the no-reference architecture that there are NoSQL stores in the operational environment. And we're the ones with our information management knowledge that should be supporting that and architecting that. So I'm talking about your Cassandras, your Reacts, your MongoDB, CouchDB, et cetera, et cetera, that whole movement. That's all NoSQL, that's all operational. That's ERP stuff from, from our perspective. They don't call it that. They don't know what to call it. But it is. It's operational from our mindset, all right? Hadoop is analytical. Hadoop is analytical. And the other thing is MapReduce, which is the way we get the information out of Hadoop data stores. So the analytic ecosystem. I've gone over some of the major components now. Call it a, uh, call it a virtual data warehouse if you want to. Call it a logical data warehouse if you want to. But I say that the data warehouse is that database in the middle here, and then there's all these other things. We've got Hadoop, column restores, uh, data marts, and our data warehouse appliances. But what about this? What if I move the appliance down and it's fed directly from source, okay? You see, it's getting really muddled as to what's the data warehouse and do I have two data warehouses and all this. The important thing is that you're consistent with the terminology inside your shop, okay? Be consistent with the terminology inside your shop. Here's another variation. The appliance feeds a columnar database. I thought only the warehouse fed the column. Again, you're being agile. You're being agile, you're being opportunistic. You have to move, but you wanna move in, a, in, a, in an architected fashion. All right, this is the art side of what we do. Oh, but we have our data warehouse inside the appliance. Is that okay? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the appliance is gonna be cheaper per capita to have data in, all right? The most expensive place to have it is in the OLTP database, all right? Hadoop being the cheapest, but it's not for everything. So can the appliance be the data warehouse? Uh, yes, it certainly can, but there are some Achilles heels with appliances that you have to acknowledge and make sure that that's not you, all right, that you can live with that limitation. And of course we have data marts now that we are finally acknowledging can exist and live that are fed directly from source, so-called independent data marts, and that's okay. It's all combinations. Now, I talked a little bit about NoSQL, and you may have seen something like this. I actually like it though, so I'm repeating it here. There's different camps of NoSQL technology. Key value, which is kind of raw, bare metal, key value, key value, key value, and some uh, token for end of record kind of thing, uh, basic stuff, uh, but it scales. Hadoop, you might argue, is, is on that side as well. Okay, big data size. Some people ask me, William, where, where's this? Where's this point that we have to start thinking about this? Uh, I don't know, probably some, some terabytes, some measure of terabytes, okay? just to give you an idea of where the SQL comfort zone ends. Document stores, which are key value stores that have some additional capabilities. Uh, column stores, not to be confused with columnar databases, which I just talked about, okay? It's not that, it's kind of that idea in terms of the structure, but it is NoSQL. It is key value pairs uh, uh, with the data stored as columns, kind of like what I showed you. And finally, graph stores, which are out here, I don't even like them being part of this, but they are NoSQL. You don't have to have big data size for a graph database to make sense. When relationships is the data, that's when you need a graph database. When you care mostly about relationships, think about the social graph, all right? You're connected to people, they're connected to people, that sort of thing. That makes a great uh, candidate for a graph database. The NoSQL challenge is getting beyond the Netflixes and the PayPals and the Ebays, and I know you're thinking, uh, that's not me, so do I care, should I care? Yes, you should care about this. Um, every one of the Global 2000, I believe, has a pilot or a pre-production uh, version of NoSQL running right now. And uh, the, the challenge is really getting that into production. Why? Because it's not up to enterprise standards yet in many ways. There's no RAID. ACID is compromised. People don't understand it. Now, take this the right way, but I've found that 
it's primarily IT that kind of puts up the walls when it comes to things like this. All right, don't, don't, don't be that. Don't be that, that guy, that girl, okay? Look for whatever it takes, whatever it takes to deliver to the business with the knowledge and the acknowledgement that there is no one size fits all and that you have to move on. So back to the no reference architecture. There are some what I call blankets, which are foundational components of this. If you accept that you're going to move forward in this way, you have to put the support in place. And that support is things like data integration, number one. Data integration, not hand coding, but a way to do data integration across the enterprise, a way to get to my data integration when I need it for the application that I'm doing right now, quickly. Not to compromise that, not to have to think about it, but to be good at a data integration, maybe one tool, maybe an enterprise data integration tool, data virtualization. Data virtualization, what's that doing up here? That's going to hit all the seams of the heterogeneous environment. I need to connect some data from here and here. I call data virtualization the perpetual short-term solution because it meets a short-term need, but it can meet, a, it, you can just leave it in place as part of the architecture. So it's going to catch some seam stuff, it's going to catch some seam stuff, but it's also going to be architected right into many of your queries over time. Now, if I had more time, I would talk about MDM and data virtualization. I think that's a killer app for data virtualization. Finally, I have governance up here, which is that soft stuff, that business uh, involvement uh, and rulemaking capability across everything here. You want to do all this with governance. You have a lot to go socialize now. So back to master data management as another core element of this architecture. I got, I've got it in red here. That's the hub, of course. That's where the master data is stored. That's where it's collected in real time from wherever it originates and it's distributed from. Now, the point of this is to visually show you that you might have little MDM hubs all over the place in your environment. They're all fed from the master. They're all fed from the master. But don't they all need a master customer list, a master product list? How many applications don't need a customer list? Okay, some. But most need some form of master data, which lends itself to master data management. So do it right, do it once, leverage that throughout the environment. That's the value of master data management. Some people say, no, it's in the origination mechanism, the governance, the workflow. Okay. It's multifaceted, actually, in terms of value proposition. But I'm going to show you here in a minute, there, that some uh, stores, out there will actually only access the MDM hub, all right? It won't need its own copy of MDM data. It will just access the hub directly, and that's okay, too. That's okay, too. Again, you've got to be creative to be successful in this role. It's a creative role, and you have to be flexible and agile, and, and you have to have knowledge of all these different categories of data store and be ready to bring the right one to bear on the organization. Obviously, I'm not going to go over every nook and cranny of this graph, but the point is that these are all the data stores I've just talked about, real quick. And across the top, you see a bunch of characteristics. Get it later, whatever, but my point is that there is no one-size-fits-all. You want petabytes, okay, don't put that in the data warehouse. You want unstructured data, don't put that in a cube. But so many of you and so many of my clients have done the wrong thing, and that's where, that's where uh, the fun begins. Because it's like trying to force fit a circle into a square, or some such analogy. That's what we're doing. And there is no one size fits all, despite what the vendors say about their particular wares. You have to embrace a lot of technologies. Is this for you? All of these technologies in my shop? Maybe not all, but more. And you're thinking, oh, I've got, I've got a lot of technology. No. You've got a lot of BI tools. You've got a lot of databases. But they're all the same. They're not, there's not some columnars and some appliances and some in-memory stores and MDM. You're not doing that. That's progressive. Yeah, OK, prune your BI tool list, whatever, what have you. But progressive is to move forward into the no-reference architecture. So my key takeaways for you. <clears throat> 
heterogeneity of systems is required. There is one best technology category for a workload, and it's your job to figure out what that is once you've identified your workload. Master data management, to pick on one, addresses key business challenges. I think I've come back to that a few times. I feel like it's really important in the grand scheme of things as you move forward. Utilizing systems for ill-fitting functionality creates challenges. And that's probably the key message here. And if you're struggling with whatever you're doing, think about replatforming. Think about replatforming it when you realize, when your business realizes the power of performance, the power of performance, then you will have to do everything you possibly can to deliver that performance to your business. And it may or may not be through the way you're doing it now. Like methodology, which we didn't talk about getting there too much, architectures need to be agile. So my, my no reference architecture, okay? It's meant to be agile. It's not meant to be a laminated reference architecture. It's going to be customized all along the way. So don't think that you're going to lay down an architecture and that's going to be it. It's not going to be it. We're entering a period of chaos, which is the title of my talk, right? A period of more chaos. You think we've had chaos. We're having more chaos. We're right on the cusp of it. This is a high risk, high reward business. And you have to take the right risks backed by the right kind of knowledge. So that is what I had to share, Paul. So thank you very much. Thank you, William. I do want to make one announcement. If you're leaving today, um, due to the incident that, uh, that happened uh, right in front of the Bellagio this morning, they've got the strip completely closed down. So if you're leaving today, you may, not, may need uh, to leave uh, extra room to get a cab because we can't get north on the strip here. So you actually may have to walk across the street in front of the Bellagio to the, to the Cosmopolitan to get a cab. So they say the, the, the strip could be closed for the next seven, eight hours. So just be cognizant of that. Um, there was an incident about 3 o'clock this morning that shut the strip down. So uh, it may take you more, more time to get a tab, cab. All right? Enjoy the last two days. Thank you very much.